but it's three o'clock as I have it here. So uh, first of all, welcome to everybody and uh, thanks for this uh, coming to this virtual news conference with the city of Bloomington, Monroe County, uh, Indiana University and IU Health. Um, first of all, about how this works, if you haven't done a Zoom call, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Uh, that really helps with being able to hear everything. The audio cuts out if there's audio on your end and your mic is on. Uh, if you're on a computer, you can submit a question on the chat room. I'll monitor those and ask those questions. Uh, please do identify your media organization when you're asking your question. Uh, and so the speakers that we will have in order, I'm Chuck Carney, Director of Media Relations for Indiana University and hosting this today. Uh, our speakers are Ben Hunter, who is the Associate Vice President for Public Safety and Institutional Assurance at Indiana University, Monroe County Commissioner Julie Thomas, uh, Dr. Thomas Sharp, Monroe County Public Health Officer, Allison Moore, the Emergency Director of Management for Monroe County, uh, Brian Shockney, President of IU Health South Central Region, and John Hamilton, the Mayor of the City of Bloomington. Uh, each speaker will deliver some brief opening remarks uh, for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll open up to your questions uh, and take those. So Ben Hunter has to get on another call at uh, 3.30 sharp, so we're going to go to him first to make some opening remarks uh, about the situation, how we are working together from the IU standpoint. Thank you, Chuck, uh, and I appreciate uh, the invite and being on the call. So uh, IU, at IU, we began our uh, response uh, late January. We were uh, obviously tipped off mid-January and seeing what was going on in China. We have a lot of international students, so we started monitoring uh, China quite closely, started working with our uh, overseas study and our international services uh, faculty and staff. And uh, our response at that time was containment like the rest of the world. Uh, we were working to get students uh, back in some cases, uh, assisting them with academic issues and, uh, and, and travel issues. Uh, so we were able to get our operations going. I think we're like in day 60 of our emergency operations stance. Uh, so our staff has been working very long hours uh, uh, and as this then started going over into Italy and Spain where we have a large population of students as well. We were closely monitoring it and as we started seeing cases pop up in the United States. Uh, we've had our, our actual EOC open for I think about four weeks now uh, and so we have that uh, staffed uh, uh, frequently uh, uh, every day except for Sunday where we try to take a little bit of a break and we've gone virtual as much as possible. Um, <clears throat> we've appreciated all of our partners uh, you know, and, and throughout this whole process. Our, our guiding principle from day one is to rely on the CDC guidance when available. Uh, we were pretty aggressive in putting in some travel restrictions for, for IU. Uh, we were uh, working with our Big Ten partners and uh, had set up uh, what we call incident management teams with them. Uh, we finally then, a few weeks ago, established a statewide incident management team with all institutions of higher ed uh, to kind of see what, uh, what each institution was planning and preparing for. Uh, that allowed us to feed up information to our executive policy group, which President McRobbie leads. Uh, that group meets daily. Uh, we continue to, to monitor it and put out policies affecting the IU system and making sure that we're working with both internal and external partners uh, constantly throughout this process. Uh, it's been uh, a, a long process for us, and we know that it's uh, you know, obviously going to get worse here in the United States. And so we've been preparing the, the best we can in terms of our supply lines, uh, making sure we have uh, adequate policies in place. Um, obviously, it's, you know, most of you know that um, essentially we've asked We've asked our students not to return. Uh, we're, we're moved to uh, distance ed kind of teaching in terms of virtual or online teaching. Um, and the, the faculty have been great uh, with that response. Uh, from, from day one, uh, we've not had any resistance in uh, our overall stance and our response. Currently, um, our EOC has moved out of a, our basement on Second Street. And we're uh, in Franklin Hall where we can do practice social distancing. We have half the team there and half the team virtually. 
Um, so we are requiring medical checks prior to coming in uh, to the EOC and we continue to operate with uh, the local health departments in all of the jurisdictions that IU campuses are located. Uh, we really appreciate uh, both Marion and Monroe County who we have the closest relationships with throughout this process as, as well as the state of Indiana and the state health department. Um, other significant actions to date, uh, tomorrow we're shipping out 20,000 N95s uh, of PPE, putting them in the IU Health supply chain. Um, we are also sending 4,295s to the city of Bloomington, uh, working with them for their supply chain for both the police and fire. Uh, we've been able to continue to work with our uh, purchasing and, uh, over the last 30 or so days um, to make sure that we can uh, get what we can and also send out what we can because uh, we know a surge is coming here in Indiana. Uh, so again, those are the, the current stances that we have in place, and I'm happy to answer any questions about IU's response and just tell you that how grateful we are to our city and county partners throughout Indiana, the state, and especially our local health departments who have been just tremendous to work with. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Julie Thomas. Hi everyone, I'm Julie Thomas, Monroe County Commissioner. We're gonna be hearing soon from Dr. Sharp and Penny Caudill from the Monroe County Health Department, uh, and also from Allison Moore, the Monroe County Emergency Management Director in just a moment. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, uh, both Lee Jones and Penny Giffins are also uh, on this call. Uh, we did make an emergency, a local emergency declaration last week. It seems like it was a year ago as everything seems to move so quickly, but it was just last week. Uh, this was extended through the end of March and it is likely to be extended obviously beyond that time. Most county buildings are closed to the public and our parks are also closed, although our trails are open. Um, please practice social distancing. Uh, this step was taken last week to prevent the spread of this virus, to protect our community, and to ensure that our employees are also safe. We instituted our continuity of government plan. Monroe County remains open for business, but business looks a little bit different. Uh, even with the governor's order, uh, staff are working remotely. Departments have minimal in-person staffing. If you need assistance from a Monroe County office, please go to our website, co.monroe.in.us to see what uh, each department has in terms of their plans for continuity of, of operations. Uh, we do remain open for business. We uh, have provided some funding for United Way Coalition and also for the Hoosier Hills Food Bank for an emergency food purchase. And lastly, we have a request pending before the Food and Beverage Tax Advisory Commission to release uh, already collected food and beverage tax revenue to allow uh, Monroe County, outside of the city of Bloomington, Monroe County businesses, small businesses, uh, to get some relief. Um, we know that times are really tight, and especially um, uh, for our small businesses and their employees. Uh, so we encourage small business owners who do anything to support tourism, who um, operate outside of the city of Bloomington, but inside Monroe County to complete the survey. That is right, uh, that information is available right on our homepage, uh, co.monroe.in.us. It's under breaking news. So everyone, please stay home as much as possible to protect yourself and others in our community. We are all in this together. Monroe County government has pledged to continue to serve our community in the best way possible. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Sharp. We were having some audio problems at Monroe County Health Department. They were saying they weren't hearing us for some reason, so I fear that that may be happening there. Is Allison, are you there? Okay, uh, let's go on to Brian and hopefully they'll be able to reconnect in. Great, thank you. Um, this is unprecedented times and uh, IU Health, our mission is to provide the best care for our patients. 
Uh, first of all, I want to recognize our teams and our of caregivers who are doing an outstanding job and working with public health. Um, as was said before, we have a terrific uh, public health department here in uh, Monroe County, and we also work with the counties uh, that surround us as well. Um, our goal here is to, to limit the spread of COVID-19 and create a safe environment for our healthcare workers and be good stewards of the resources because we know that personal protective equipment, which we call PPE, is uh, in uh, a precious resource for our supplies. Uh, our healthcare teams have extensive experience in treating communicable diseases. Uh, as we see continued awareness around COVID-19, we're closely working with the State Department of Health, not only at the regional level, but also at the state level, um, and working with CDC and government organizations as well. Um, we also were monitoring what was going on around the world and the nation and uh, put into place our EOC programs and actually went live with our incident command March 19th or March 9th of 2020. Um, that incident command is something we drill on twice a year for any disasters or any uh, pandemics. Um, it requires a 24-7, 365. Uh, it's a very comprehensive structure, um, and we operate it and have been operating it ever since. It, re uh, it requires section chiefs and officers that participate in state, regional, local, local incident briefings. We have no less than three briefings daily and uh, look at all things related to uh, logistics, uh, surge plans, uh, equipment, all of those things that, that you can imagine. We have had to uh, move to our, all of our facilities in the region uh, to basically two locations where patients can enter, enter and exit our buildings. One is the emergency department and the other is one other uh, location where we are screening all patients um, and visitors as they come in. Uh, something we instituted this past, just this past midnight, uh, we've seen that uh, the COVID virus is also uh, showing up in symptoms of diarrhea, some non-atypical symptoms uh, and fever. And so every patient who walks in our facility to seek services will be masked uh, and just to protect our health, our patient, our healthcare workers as well as our patients. So that has just started as we continue Continue to learn more and more about this virus. Uh, we've also secured two of our uh, EMS ambulances to ensure that we can provide safe uh, care and uh, transportation for any COVID-19 uh, patients. And our team members have uh, been trained and continually trained and educated regarding this. Um, our, our main concern is our uh, per per conservation of personal protective equipment, and we continue to monitor that. Uh, and have had great partners, Indiana University, um, you know, Cook Medical, um, many others. We even had, had a, a couple car dealerships who use N95s for painting who have given us masks uh, to make sure that we have what we need to care for patients and protect our healthcare workers. Um, one of the things that we're instituting uh, today is in all billing statements, uh, due to the financial impact this is having on our communities, um, there will be a payment option to not make uh, the monthly statement payments for our patients, whether they, those are monthly payments that they have to make this next month or their new uh, billings to them this next month, they will not have to make those uh, payments. Um, so that, that will go out in every statement and letter to all of our patients um, and uh, give them that, that break uh, from any financial needs that they have. Speaking of financial needs, uh, we're also going to be sure that our employees get a full paycheck. So we've implemented a resource staffing pool and we are uh, redeploying our resources around the region and also doing uh, some different things around training and development. Um, so we have our, our employees online, our team members online. So as we see the surge, um, they're still engaged with us working and get a full paycheck, but also prepared for uh, caring for our patients uh, going forward. Um, as, as of today, all of our construction projects are moving forward. We've had several uh, questions about that and the uh, new building site continues uh, in its uh, current schedule and is still on time in its construction. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, John, let's go ahead and go to you. Unmute, can you hear me all right? We got you. Thanks very much. Um, I want to, um, let me just 
Um, just listen first, uh, John Hamilton here. Thank you everyone for all you are doing. Um, it is an entire community effort. You've heard so much hard work described and most of it is not described and I just really wanna appreciate that. I also wanna thank IU for setting this uh, virtual press conference up. Uh, we are in a serious, deadly health crisis with a pandemic. Um, we see it unfolding around the country. It's almost like a preview uh, of what is going to happen here as we see what's happening in places around the country. Um, and we haven't mentioned yet, I think some others may add detail on the governor's stay at home order, which is a major uh, step uh, taken today uh, to, to um, order over the next two weeks, essentially that everyone stay home wherever possible, um, except for essential activities and industries. Um, we are in, I, I've said we're in a marathon, not a sprint. That's not actually right. We're in a marathon that starts with a sprint. Um, <laughs> we are all in a sprint right now to try to um, uh, deal with these challenges, but we are also in a marathon that's gonna be a long haul uh, and in a very dynamic situation. And I so appreciate everybody uh, working together. Just very quickly on city government, uh, we do continue to operate. We're maintaining essential services. The water system, of course, is fundamental. Public safety, sanitation, transit, animal welfare, others uh, to help our community operate. We've stood up a continuity of city government team. It's met five times in the last 10 days just to ensure that we're protecting our workforce and doing dozens of protocol changes. For example, uh, I. I, I can mention tomorrow the transit system is going fare free uh, starting Tuesday morning um, and asking all patrons to enter and leave from the back doors of the buses. Uh, that will help our drivers uh, and, and, uh, patient, um, and people on the transit system and, and dozens of other changes in the protocols like that. Um, we've, we continue to support the outstanding health professionals who are so dedicated in that system that you've heard from already. Uh, congratulations to their leadership uh, from the county and from the IU Health and their partners um, to flatten the curve, uh, a challenge to all of us, protect the ability of our healthcare system to protect all of us with physical distancing, which is even more uh, stringent with the orders uh, today, with regular communication and planning among the institutions that you have on this call and, and many others. Um, following the facts in the health system, uh, leading us with their recommendations um, and, and supporting from the city side, supporting the county and the IU health system and all their partners in their leadership on the health systems. Um, I do want to note that uh, in addition to the health system and their expertise, there are at least two other areas that we, we think need focused attention and energy, uh, both in the immediate and the longer term. Uh, this is underway, but an additional focus. One area is the whole area of social services assuring that our safety net supports people uh, in this pandemic, and things like housing, that's special needs for housing during this pandemic, uh, food security challenges that are special during this time, uh, child and youth care needs, particularly for essential workers in the health system or, or public safety and with many child care centers closing and other interventions, that's one area. A second area is really just the economic survival, um, how we help families meet immediate income needs, how we help at-risk businesses meet immediate cash flow needs, and then, and then the longer-term planning for how we get through COVID-19 and how we come out of it on the other side with as strong an economy as we can. So um, in addition to the extremely well-functioning health system and the coordination at the county and IU Health and others, I, I am, as Mayor, calling to create a couple additional leadership teams on those two areas uh, to supplement and actually let the health system focus on the health. Uh, and on the social services, I'm asking a, a group of philanthropic institutions um, uh, to help lead this with uh, Community Foundation, United Way Health Foundation, the Bloomington Health Foundation, the IU Foundation, and the IU Health Foundation to come together. Uh, much of this is already happening. Uh, emergency grants were announced today, and uh, I know there's a fantastic resource page that's already been stood up. Uh, you can find it at MonroeCountyCOVID-19.org. Uh, that, that is a first stage on this. But I do think uh, the uh, social service team and in a parallel economic response team led by economic and labor leaders, including the uh, Bloomington Economic Development Corporation, the Chamber of Commerce, and the uh, 
economic and sustainable development as well as others. Um, uh, and, and with these two new teams um, through their leadership, I'm gonna ask that over the next 72 hours, um, they at least develop initial plans on how to gather the data and create forecasts that are needed, the plans to develop the set of priorities that we need, consulting with experts and providers to meet critical needs, develop short and long-term budgets. You heard some reference to funding and uh, we know we're gonna need funding and to develop those funding plans and, and the resources that we need uh, and oversee their implementation. Also consider geographic scope and such. Uh, city staff can help with that. Uh, and I just wanna note um, that importance of helping the health system focus on the health issues and standing up a couple other entities that can, that can deal with these others. We are first and foremost focused on saving lives and supporting that health system, but then additionally with the social safety net to protect our most vulnerable and with economic planning to try to minimize damage. Um, lots of national, international, state efforts, we depend on that. We, I'll just, we will get through this together, uh, I know that, uh, and we will do that more safely and more successfully uh, when we do it together with planning and coordination. And I wanna thank um, so much all the people who are helping with this. And uh, Chuck, I'll hand it back to you, uh, whether we're for questions or, or for the other county folks. Thanks a lot. And uh, have we successfully gotten our Monroe County folks on here? Well, proving that technology is great until it isn't. Uh, Julie Thomas can uh, deliver a little bit of what, uh, what uh, Allison Moore was going to share with us. Yes, uh, fortunately, thank you so much, Chuck. Fortunately, uh, Allison uh, was able to at least text me some of her key points that she wanted, to, wanted me to share for her. Uh, first of all, for anyone who's thinking about a way to help the community, uh, we are having, we are experiencing a blood shortage. Uh, so we are working on securing a date. Emergency Management uh, Monroe County is securing a date to hold um, a fund, uh, a blood drive, and that will be announced very soon, both the date and location. So please plan on participating any way you can. Um, Allison also reports that emergency management is working with our public safety providers to ensure that we understand all the needs for personal protective equipment and then submitting re requests to the state. So they're funneling all of that, all of those requests um, up to the state. And uh, Monroe County Emergency Management has a virtual emergency operations center open. And um, again, uh, any requests related to public safety are being handled through that, um, that entity. So I wanted to share that and thank you, Allison. Okay, so with that, uh, happy to op open it up to questions. If you have any questions, you can just speak up here. You can also submit those on chat and if you would identify the uh, news organization you're with. Hi, Chuck. It's C. Scambaluri. Uh, may I ask a question? Uh, sure. Okay. You sounded unsure. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, for those, I know most of the names on the screen. For those of you who don't know, I'm the city council representative for District 2. That's the near, near, near north side. Um, this is a question for Benjamin. Ben, um, the residence halls I know are all closed, but do you have any sense on what's happening with off-campus housing? I know that's not something IU controls, but do you have a sense of whether or not Evolve is empty or 50% empty or anything like that? I, I do not have the sense. We have urged students to go to their permanent residence. Uh, we know that not all will do that, um, but I've not got the sense uh, in terms of the off-campus housing, whether students are vacating that. Um, they have obviously have entered into private leases, so those are things they'll right. probably they'll have to negotiate uh, with, the, with the landlords, but we continue to message that we prefer students go to their permanent addresses. Okay, thank you. Um, Emily Ernsberger from the Herald Times poses this question. What does the governor's executive order to stay at home mean for the city, county, and IU employees? Will more buildings, namely at IU and within the city, be closed and more workers sent home? And if so, with or without pay? Uh, ben, I'll start with you on the IU part and then everybody else can jump in. Well, we're closely looking at the governor's uh, directive, uh, executive order. We have a meeting on that later today. Uh, we know that there's some exemptions for essential employees for higher education that's in there. Uh, you know, our 
obviously what we continue to be open in terms of delivering our academic and research missions, uh, we're just operating differently, as Julie had pointed out. We're doing it virtually. We have essential employees that uh, are outlined throughout IU policies in terms of uh, units that will determine that. And so we'll look at that order and we'll make decisions going forth uh, that, that, that yeah, excuse me, based on that order uh, to make sure that we can continue to function as a university. Uh, but where we can, we've asked all our employees, the ones that can, to work from home. Uh, we've asked them to uh, go there, uh, work from home, shelter at home, uh, work virtually as much as possible. We're going to continue to ask them to do that. Mayor Hamilton? Uh, yes. Am I muted? No. You hear me? Thanks. Thank you. Emily, thank you for the question. And I, I will say a lot of what Ben said. Uh, we are studying. I have a meeting I think I'm late for already for with this, but to, to, to look into those details. Um, it will certainly affect us to some degree. Um, we have a number of buildings closed. We have not closed City Hall. That may mean we look at that. Um, we have a number of, of course, employees that we, we view as essential for providing services, many of which I named. But on the other hand, we are adjusting work already. A lot of telework happening. Um, you probably know we, we, we uh, uh, delayed uh, apartment inspections for the safety of our people and others um, for a couple months. So that's happened. We've, uh, we've changed the parking rules, given everybody two, two hours of free parking. We are uh, you know, we'll have to decide things, uh, though. For example, do we keep filling potholes um, or not uh, over this period? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I know uh, um, we, will, we will try to keep uh, people engaged safely where we can uh, and with construction projects and others uh, to continue. Uh, and in terms of payment, uh, again, we've looked very closely at that. We're trying to make sure, like any employer, we we support all of our employees as fully as we can responsibly. I just, it's just a, a few hours in, so we have to, we'll have to get you uh, more complete answers as soon as we can. Thanks. Question from Skip Daly with WCLS. I would like the mayor and the IU health director um, to both share their top three, top three priorities of what they want the media message to be. And I think uh, the IU health director means you, Ben, uh, on this one. And either one of you can go first. All right, I'll go first, Ben, for this one, if that's right. So thank you, Skip, uh, for that question. I mean, I uh, th three messages. Um, number one, um, this is a very serious, deadly pandemic. Um, and that what we see on the media of other places like New York and California and Washington and others is a, is a forecast, a preview of what is coming with this uh, uh, with this disease, and so reminding people this is a very serious, deadly pandemic. Uh, I think second, reminding people that what each of us does is very important in terms of flattening the curve and helping us uh, protect our healthcare system and our neighbors by doing the very strong steps of physical or social distancing, as we as we describe it, and as the governor has indicated, um, and. And then third, I guess, I'd encourage the media to remind people to breathe deep, stay calm, we will get through it, uh, and you can help in many ways, as, as Julie Thomas mentioned, as, as Ben and others have often mentioned, ways to step in and help. And I do think the media continuing to share this information is very helpful. Thank you for asking. Uh, ben? Well, from an IU perspective, uh, our message is about health and safety and not much different than what Mayor Hamilton talked about. Social distancing is key. Um, if you are sick, stay at home. Uh, and finally, uh, this is about uh, all of us. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. Um, the reason IU is in such a great position to act early and decisively is that we have been monitoring it, and working with our students overseas. We knew what was coming, uh, so a decisive decision has been made and we want our students to go back to their permanent addresses. Uh, we want them to take the, the health advice of, uh, national and local very seriously and stay inside uh, to flatten the curve, uh, to make sure that we uh, can, do not have the surge that we've witnessed in China and Italy. Um, those are things that we do not want here in the United States. So that's what we would, I would like the media to completely underscore and remind folks that this is about all of us, not just a, a subset. This actually does affect younger people more than uh, what previous studies have been out there. 
Um, so that's coming out more and more. And, and the last thing is we just simply don't want you taking it to other people, uh, you know, your grand, grandparents, uh, older populations, all of that, just because there's, um, you know, the thought that this doesn't affect young people or you recover quickly. Um, this is about all of us to get through this together as a nation and the world. I'm going to come back to Emily Ernsberger's question again and give Julie Thomas a chance to respond. Uh, the question again was, what does the governor's executive order to stay at home mean for the city, county, and IU employees? Julie. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say that, that um, we were a little bit ahead of this curve on getting um, most of the county buildings closed as much as we could. Obviously, we do have uh, courts and, and the jail. Um, and we do have essential services that need to operate, but uh, we, I wanted to make sure that our community knew that w when we uh, send our employees home to work remotely, um, if they can, um, that we are fully paying our employees both full-time and part-time in this process because we don't want anyone else to, there's, a, there's already enough stress out there. We don't want to add economic stress to our employees' lives. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, real Quickly, Amy Meek has a statement from Penny, who uh, we have still uh, technologically haven't connected in here. So Amy, if you want to read that. Hi, Chuck, thank you. Uh, my name is Amy Meek, so I'm the program manager for Monroe County Public Health Clinic. Penny sent me an email since she hasn't been able to connect. Her statement is, Governor Holcomb just released a statewide stay-at-home order to go into effect Tuesday, May 24th at midnight. The Monroe County Health Department supports this order as being a critical strategy to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the community. Social distancing is the key public health strategy to reduce disease transmission, and it will help save lives as well as keep our hospitals from being overwhelmed. We wanna thank everyone for their efforts in this pandemic. We know that it has disrupted lives and even livelihoods, and that is as difficult for many people. We appreciate your understanding knowing that each of you have a role to play in helping us overcome this pandemic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so it, I, I'm waiting for another question to come in. Anybody have one they want to ask here online? Um, I think Dave Rollo has one if you want to go ahead and ask. Yeah, can you hear him? Yep. Okay. Um, I, I'll ask this question for Commissioner Thomas. Hi, Julie. Um, because we don't have uh, people from the uh, Monroe County uh, uh, Health Department. Um, it's more of a concern of mine, and that is, so thinking about what the Surgeon General said today about everyday matters uh, in this process, thinking about the fact that people have a long latency period when they get infected and they they shed virus, but they don't know it. So that can continue for weeks. It seems to me one very important vector for transmission right now are grocery store uh, cashiers. So these are people who are coming in contact with hundreds of people per day, could become infected, and then could pass it to the next customer, successive customers, without knowing it for potentially weeks. Since self-isolation has limitations, people have to go grocery shopping, it seems to me that we need to not only protect those grocery store employees, but I think that we need to, and issue them PPE, I think they need masks, to protect themselves and to protect the customers. Where they come from, I don't know. Uh, I know they're in short supply, I know that health workers are a major priority, I know that emergency responders are priority, but these are on frontline people too. And one other concern I have is that I was told, this is anecdotal, but I was told that workers at a local grocery chain were told they were not allowed to wear masks, even if they had them. And whether the health department could intercede and, and, and have a declaration that, uh, that companies could not prohibit people from wearing masks. That would be one step. The other step would be to issue masks from some source to those employees. Thanks. Uh, Dave, that's a really interesting question, and it's one of those things I've been thinking about a lot because we take for granted a lot of people who are these essential workers in our economy, especially food and, and fuel and things like that, um, and we do want to protect them, and we need to protect them. 
Um, I might I might turn some of your question over to uh, Brian Shockney uh, about protective equipment, but also then I can pass on your question to uh, both Penny and Allison because I can't I won't speak for them and I can't speak for them. Uh, but maybe Brian could talk a little bit about the protective equipment and how it's and whether it's useful or not. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the CDC guidelines, because this is a droplet precautions, really, if you have the the flu, then the virus, then you're going to shed it. And having a mask on the person who has it is most important. Um, the best thing we we can do is monitor as uh, we monitor our employees and and have in the in this instance with the um, the checkout people is to have them monitor daily their symptoms. So do they have any symptoms? Do they have a temperature? How do they feel? Um, and be sure that they're not coming to work. We, we daily remind our employees um, that they need to be very cognizant of how they're feeling, their temperature, um, aches, pains, whatever it is, and, and take it seriously and do not come to work. Um, if you feel ill in any way, and then use the virtual hub that IU Health has set up across the state of Indiana. It's had over 8,000 visits to it, um, where it's free screening, and, and so anyone you know, in Monroe County can call that, uh, or go into that virtual hub in that app, and they can get screened, or they could you know, call their, their primary care provider. But uh, again, it's, it's so important for us to monitor ourselves um, but until we show those symptoms um, or we think we're, we're, we're you know, having those symptoms, um, the mask is, is for the, the patient mostly. But I, I, I agree with, I mean, I sympathize and agree with your, um, your thoughts there. Um, uh, but it's really about self-monitoring for symptoms versus uh, wearing the mask. Could, could I just ask you, Brian, what about the evidence that you, remain, you can remain 14 days or more asymptomatic? and still be spreading the virus. I mean, you wouldn't know that you have it. You wouldn't have any symptoms. Yes, it's important to monitor symptoms, but it seems to me that you could be infected and therefore you're spreading virus to people. And there was a German study that showed that people are most infective right before they show symptoms. So this is, to me, very important that we do, if we're gonna cut the transmission line, uh, we have to stop that potential for exposure from people who are potentially infected. And I would think that grocery store workers are coming in contact with literally hundreds of people per day. That's yeah, from that's a, from a uh, epidemiology standpoint, infectious disease, I'll, I'll leave that to, to the experts there. But, but I know that the best thing we're telling our uh, employees to do is to ensure that they're using, uh, number one, social distancing, but number two, just check yourself as often as you can so when you do have symptoms you're not coming to work. Um, I have a question uh, from Laura Lane at the HT uh, again to Brian can you respond to the issues surrounding the release of the Owen County patient on Sunday? Sure um, you know our patient had no symptoms for three days uh, maintained seven days of isolation and we use those discharge criteria for the CDC guidelines so the patient was no longer contagious uh, he was discharged from our hospital and left in his personal or the personal vehicle to a location agreed upon by the provider uh, additionally uh, you know due to our visitor restrictions we check every patient um, in and out of the facility. Every patient who comes in has an escort and every patient who leaves has an escort. Um, so that is not an unlikely and is actually required. Um, and our provider uh, instructed the patient to return to the hospital if they had any other concerns. And a follow-up appointment uh, was scheduled for the patient this week with uh, the patient's primary care provider. Um, other questions coming in. Uh, what precautions are being taken at the Monroe County Jail to prevent the spread? Is here to take that on? I'm not sure. Well, Sounds I, like a nice question. yeah, I I can address a little bit of this. I know that um, the sheriff has um, uh, assured all of us that uh, every um, inmate has access to uh, soap and water, uh, and also 
there is a system set up, and I could not tell you very many details about this, but I would I would pass this question to the sheriff um, individually. Uh, but there is a system set up to um, isolate um, uh, as necessary um, uh, in a separate in a separate part of the facility. So uh, there are some uh, measures in place as much as possible. Um, they've they've thought this through and they've worked through this uh, very well. So um, we are concerned, of course, about this, and um, we are keeping a very close eye on it. Thank you. I, and I can just add, um, Commissioner Thomas, no, I think knows as well that the, uh, the county and the city through the police and sheriff are, have, have actually undertaken through the courts and the jail um, uh, protocols to try to reduce the um, uh, actually increase citations instead of arrests uh, where, where we think it's safe. Uh, to send fewer people to the jail, uh, even for very short-term periods, to try to help the jail manage people coming in and out of that. And the courts and the county and the city have worked very closely to try to assure that, which helps the jail manage that, that situation. Uh, another IU health question, uh, how many beds are currently available to accommodate uh, COVID-19 patients? Yeah, so we have uh, co we have created a cohort area, actually two cohort areas with negative pressure rooms. All of these patients that are suspected or positive are housed on these two units. Um, we do that to ensure that all of our uh, team members are not moving from one patient to another, and that those they walk into work and they are practicing the best precautions for themselves and for the patients. So uh, we have two full units that are uh, not full um, but, and well prepared uh, for these patients. Um, and so we monitor daily our numbers of patients. So uh, as they, a patient goes on that unit, if even they're suspected, and then we, uh, if they get the negative test, IU Health now is doing its own testing. And so we know within 24 hours, where before we were waiting several days, now we know uh, within 24 hours, the patient status, if that's negative, then the patient is moved from that unit or discharged if they can be discharged. Um, and if they're positive, we maintain and care for them on those units. Um, one other question, uh, and Mayor Hamilton, I will direct this at you, uh, asking about how frequently these updates will occur and understanding cross-sector collaboration will be needed. How can groups across the community best coordinate with and support the central group hosting this call? This is from Jennifer Pearl at the BEDC. Uh, and we'll, so I'll just say we're hosting it. IU is hosting, but uh, the mayor's office was really setting this up uh, as much as, as anybody. So uh, I know Mayor Hamilton, you're interested in, in uh, trying to have some regular updates. Yeah, th thanks for the question. And Chuck, again, thanks for how you handling the logistics of this, which is you do terrifically. Um, I, the short answer is we don't know. Uh, it's been really uh, important and good uh, to have the folks on this call, uh, this press uh, availability meeting three times a week, we do. Um, I think we're trying to figure out what the right rhythm is uh, to do this kind of availability. I think it's really important for the media and the public to be able to ask questions and, and hear what answers we can give uh, and hear the experts uh, from health and others. Uh, so we, we don't know yet. Uh, we, we welcome feedback on what you think would be useful rhythm for that. Uh, on the second question, absolutely there's you know again in this sprint that we're in moving into a marathon this sprint uh, has has had a lot of folks uh meeting and collaborating typically virtually which is good uh to share information and i think that will probably evolve as we go um uh, the cross sector uh, information sharing is is really important uh and we'll we'll continue to evolve that too frankly but uh, I know you, Jen, the, the questioner, and many others are regularly talking together. Uh, I think I think we're at a point where structuring some of this, like the health system, is so well structured with county leadership, county health, IU Health, and others, setting up a couple more that are structured a little tighter with focusing on social services and funding going to social services and fo focusing on economic uh, management, economic recovery, and it's similarly funding uh, being being um, intelligently directed into that will be helpful, and all those things we'll need to talk together. Thanks, Mayor Hamilton. Uh, a 
couple of other questions. Uh, a question about a link or URL to the free screening hub. Yes, we can send uh, send that out to everyone that's on this call afterwards. Actually. Okay. Uh, the and another question also for for you: uh, How many beds in a unit? So those units vary, um, and we have so we have two full units. Um, those are depending on if we are putting two patients in a room or one patient in a room. So to give you a, an exact number, for example, if a husband and wife, we can put them in the same room together. Um, and but if you know it's different people from different households, we would not put them in the same room. So it's going to vary on the number of beds we have depending on uh, the family units that we have in our facility. Okay. Other questions here on the call? Hi, this is Ethan Burks from WTIU WFIU News. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, there was talk, I can't remember who, someone brought up a blood drive earlier. Uh, I'm just wondering how that would work logistically, um, given uh, that we're trying to social distance and stop the spread of the coronavirus. So how exactly would a blood drive be set up? Because it would be quite different, I imagine, than normal blood drive. So if someone could please explain kind of the logistics of that, that'd be great. Yep, I, I, can, I can do that. Uh, thanks for the great question. Um, although I don't have specifics, I do know that that's absolutely the consideration as we move forward. Uh, one of the things that has happened is the um, Monroe County Convention Center has seen all of its conventions canceled through early May, um, and they have uh, graciously offered that building uh, for the use uh, as needed to uh, during this time of uh, the pandemic. So um, that's one of the options. I'm not sure that that's what we're going with, but the idea would be to utilize a large space and to put people in by appointment or to stagger them in so that there's not that much interaction and then the actual uh, phlebotomist healthcare workers would be protected, um, I would assume. So I don't have much detail beyond that, but that's definitely why this is taking a little bit longer to set up than we would like because there are a lot of those kind of details to, uh, to work out. And, and, and um, Allison Moore is doing a great job pulling this together. So be assured that uh, once it's pulled together, that there will be every possible um, um, opportunity that we can find to protect uh, everyone involved, we will, we will utilize that. And a follow-up to how many beds in a unit, how many rooms in a unit at the hospital? Yeah, so that's going to vary again. So our surge plan, we have machines that we can convert any room into a negative pressure room. So after we, let's say we would fill, if, if uh, we predicted a, uh, you know, what's that, that worst case scenario, best case scenario, most likely. Um, and we, if, if we have to add rooms, we have machines on hand that we can convert any room into a negative pressure room. So really, it's kind of an unlimited number of rooms that we can make uh, in our hospital negative pressure. We already had some that were negative pressured that could, because we always have those all of our IC rooms and other rooms uh, in the hospital, but we, in, in preparation for this, took two units and said, you know, let's make those two units negative pressure. Um, and we've got machines actually on standby to increase those numbers throughout the hospital. So we can flex up and down those numbers of rooms for COVID positive patients uh, at the turn of a switch with our maintenance team. Okay, uh, other questions on the call? Uh, I have a question for Mayor Hamilton. This is Ethan again. Uh, Mayor, you, Mr. Mayor, you said something about the fare free uh, transit. Uh, could you kind of talk about that a little more and kind of what the timeline for that's going to be? I forgot which day you said it was going to start. Sure. Yeah, that, that this is an example of the uh, quickly evolving. Um, the Bloomington Transit just announced today, uh, we announced we're going to make fare free riding beginning tomorrow, Tuesday morning. Um, uh, for the foreseeable future, at least in the short term here. 
uh, that the, the, the routes are changing as well. Uh, you know, they go on a spring break schedule and they've, we're kind of staying on a spring break schedule with Bloomington Transit. Ridership is significantly down, even spring break to spring break comparisons, and we expect that to continue. Uh, but for the safety, both of the bus drivers who are so important uh, and, and for the patrons, uh, it will be fare free and you'll be asked to enter and exit the bus from the back door. Um, we, uh, we're doing, as BT is also doing electrostatic cleaning uh, every night. They've gotten a very um, high-tech uh, cleaning mechanism. You know, these transit is a very important um, uh, infrastructure for, for many people getting to healthcare services or groceries or other needs that they have. So we're doing all we can to, to keep our drivers uh, on the job and safe and also keep that system operating. So it starts tomorrow morning, early, first thing. Okay, a couple other questions coming in. Uh, from Dave Askins with uh, the B Square uh, Beacon. How is the cost of the fares going to be covered by BT or allocation from the city? Uh, thanks, Dave. I don't know that. The short answer, uh, you know, we're, we're spending a lot of money in different ways. Uh, BT uh, will be, you know, fair, fares generally cover about 10% of the cost of BT, so uh, we'll be making that up, I expect, through the Bloomington Transit finances. It may come from federal government emergency declarations, too. I'm just not sure. And from Skip Daly, WCLS for IU Health, is the number of testing kits currently problematic? And if so, how many more testing kits do you expect to have over the coming weeks? Uh, good question. Thank you. We do have uh, testing kits available. We Something that we uh, did as IU Health several years ago is create an integrated service center, which is in Plainfield, Indiana, and it's a large warehouse where we've been able to stockpile a lot of things, testing kits and all those things as well. But the testing kits for COVID-19, we have those um, and have more continuously coming in. We have a daily dashboard that looks at all of our testing kits, our mediums, our, our protective equipment, all of those things. And uh, anytime anything goes below 30 days in its usage, even with its current usage and predict, uh, predictions and projections, we turn that red and then uh, look at how we're gonna to respond. We are not, um, from IU Health, we're testing our employees, our team members, and we're testing those patients who we care for. As I said previously, Lily and others are doing uh, some you know, mass testing kind of things. So given that we're testing uh, those employees or those patients and our team members, we've got enough testing kits to do what we need to do for the future. Can, can I just add, and not as a health person, but as, you know, obviously the whole testing protocols and regimes are very challenging. Um, we continue to follow the advice of health professionals on this, but I know it's frustrating for people. We wish we all could get tested and find out uh, and manage all this. But, but uh, we are where we are. And you know, our job, I think, in a lot of ways is to just help support the health system and the health professionals to make sure that they can manage with the resources that they have and, and expectation those will be increasing over time, as we've seen in some of the parts of the country that are, that are ahead of us on this curve. But thank you for the health professionals doing what you're doing. Okay, we're gonna start to wrap this up, but if we do have one other question on the uh, call, we'll go ahead and take that, if there is one. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will wrap it up. Thanks to everybody for participating, and uh, as we said, we we'll, may have some more of these updates to come as the situation continues. Thanks for your time.